Hey guys, welcome to Connexus Church. My name is Mark Clark. Good to be with you guys. Uh, we're doing a three-week series called The Magic of Christmas here at Connexus. Glad you're joining us. If you got a Bible, Luke chapter one, all three of these weeks are from Luke chapter one as they build toward, of course, the birth of Jesus on Christmas Eve. Hopefully you join us as a church for that as well. So the magic of Christmas. We're playing on this concept that our world is fascinated by. Star Wars. Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Narnia, Miracle on 34th Street, A Wonderful Life, every Disney movie, Snow White to Aladdin. If you look at the top grossing films of all time, almost all of them have some magical element to them. So supernatural thing that is beyond our natural world and our senses. And I think that's built into us. We pine for a much grander world, but also I think it could be nostalgia. We know a world in our bones, almost in our DNA, that may be like that. But and, and Christmas comes and pulls all of that out. And in that moment, there's this, there's God and there's all these spiritual elements. And he courts this prince and he comes in to save his bride, this helpless bride. And in that moment, there's angels and there's a spiritual realm and there's miracles. There's a virgin birth and it's speaking to people with stars, all this crazy stuff. But the Bible goes, but it's true. This is the difference. And, and Tolkien and Lewis talked about this often. It has all these fantastical elements, but the difference is with the Christian story is it's true. It's, it's real. It's history. It's, it's, it's the story that, that makes all those myths come true in a sense. So last week, Mary was visited by this angel. And in the, the story, her relative Elizabeth was visited by Gabriel, the angel. And Gabriel said, hey, I know you're advanced in years and you're, you're not going to have a baby naturally. Yet this angel came and proclaimed this beautiful miracle and said, you're going to have a baby. And then with Mary, even though you're a virgin, you're going to have a baby. And, and he's going to be God. You got to name him God, Jesus. God saves. and all. So, so literally, that story ended last week with a phrase that I want to come back to at the end of our time. But it, it, it said the angel departed. For, for now, we pick it up in verse 39. Mary's just been talked to by the angel, and it says this. In those days, so if you got a Bible, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 39. It says, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So these are her cousins. As you're tracking the days of our lives story here, these are her cousins. So Zechariah had been spoken to. He was a priest in the temple. That's who he was. And he, he started kind of doubting that God was going to do anything. He was skeptical. Maybe some of you are there. And he started talking back to the angel and saying, I don't really know about any of this plan. I don't think you're going to make us pregnant. We're too old. And so I, I don't really think this is going to come about. And the angel says, I want you to shut up. And he said, you're not talking anymore. No one wants to hear from you anymore. You're going to shut your yap, 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 yap. All you're doing is yapping. You shut up. But we don't want to hear you talk anymore. So he's quiet. That's where Zachariah is at. So now here he's mute. God makes this guy mute. And his wife is enjoying these months of him being mute because he's, he's mute for months, right? So I'm just saying there comes moments in life where maybe you want your spouse to shut up for a bit. Same. Uh, seasons in life where we need to, to kind of do that. That's just what life is, where God can speak and move and show himself to us in moments of kind of quietness where we're not doing all the talking. So right now he's mute. He can't talk. And she greeted the house. Mary comes in, enters the house of Zachariah. What few commentators seem to realize is that Mary's visit to Elizabeth, it's about 100 miles away in Judea, it, it, it may have been a desperate attempt by her family to save her from this fate right? The righteous killing of girls who got pregnant out of wedlock. That's often doesn't work its way. Like that's why the text says with haste, potentially, to get her out of the way until some solution had been worked out, right? So this story's heating up, guys. This isn't a nice, cute Christmas story. This is life and death. We sanitize all this, right? We got you know, your Christmas cards that you hand out. Guarantee they got squirrels and deers rumbling around in the snow, not like, oh, let's get this girl out of here so people don't kill her. Like Revelation 12 is the picture of Christmas given through like a mythopoetic version. And it's this woman and she's giving birth and there's a dragon trying to eat the baby, which of course we know from the Christmas story is Herod trying to kill, you know, Jesus, all the two-year-olds and under. But in the, in the uh, poetic way of putting it, this dragon, Satan, is trying to kill the baby and this woman's like got her feet up and she's trying, like that's guaranteed that's never been on your Christmas card. But that's what this story is. It's fear, it's tension, it's evil, it's all these things. And so after a journey of about three or four days, it says this. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, verse 41, the baby leapt in her womb. 
and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's what you've got. Who goes on to be, this is the guy who goes on to be John the Baptist, actually. John the Baptist is leaping in the womb of Elizabeth as Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus, walks into the room. So John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, and he's in utero, and he feels Jesus, right? And he starts going, like, what's going on? Luke tells us Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's what we gotta understand. This would have been a really big deal because all the people throughout the Old Testament were awaiting the time when the rules and religion would stop. We're going to temple, we're going to sacrifices. When would that stop? And relationship would arrive. The Holy Spirit would actually come. So in a time, back then they called it the eschaton, right? It's just a Greek uh, fancy word for the last days or the last things that are ever gonna happen in the world, right? God himself is gonna come in his spirit and, and come alive in the hearts and in the beings of people. One day that's gonna happen. And here Luke's going, this is what was happening. Many of us, we live in a way where we're not really all that focused on the Holy Spirit, if we're dead honest. We love the, we pray to the Father, we talk about Jesus because we're in a church, but the Holy Spirit's like that like forgotten brother. It's like, I don't know what to do with him. So we gotta understand what Luke's trying to do here. Luke mentions and talks about the Holy Spirit more than any other gospel writer between the gospel of Luke and the, and the book of Acts. So he talks about the Holy Spirit all the time. And there's a reason for that because many of us, we, we might've become Christians in our lives, but I don't know what it feels like to be walking in the Holy Spirit, you might say. So we have lives and we have sin that we're trying to deal with we're, and we feel defeated and we have temptation and we feel emotionally disconnected from God. Come on, most of you, if you're honest, there are times when you do that and you don't know why. Right, I can't walk with God, I'm failing to temptation, I'm not, and I don't know why. And we try to figure it out. We try to figure out how to live the Christian life. What are the six tactics I need to do to make sure I feel closer to God? And then we get frustrated. I'm falling to sin, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know the reasons I'm frustrated, and one of them is because I would argue that you're not living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's the point. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, which means there are measures that all of us are living at different measures of the Spirit in our lives. And so some of you are like, I, I just can't defeat this sin. I, I, can't. I, I can't, I can't walk in freedom. I have no power in my life at all. And we look to every reason under the sun except this. We aren't filled with the spirit, guys. We can't, re like we, we get our life, our, our, we're a mess financially, our marriages, our relationships, our work life, we have no passion, no joy. Oftentimes it's an issue of the spirit. It's an amazing thing that Jesus actually offers his spirit to us. And he says, listen, you're gonna be better off when the Holy Spirit comes and drops on you than for me hanging around, which is crazy. So the other day, I was sharing with you last week, I was in Folsom Prison uh, speaking to the, the inmates and talking about Jesus. And, and this guy raised his hand because we did this Q&A. And he goes, hey, listen, I'm having this issue with demons in my life and do you believe in deliverance? And I was, I was, I was talking to him, I said, yeah. Oftentimes that is a thing. You deliver a demon, you but I said this phrase and then he totally got rocked by it. I said, oftentimes, 90% of the time, the issue isn't deliverance, it's discipleship. Meaning the reason you're going to be better off when, when, um, when Jesus says this, when I leave, it's because you actually get discipleship in your life. The Holy Spirit is, is going to come into you and be active in your life. Jesus talking to the disciples about not because you had some momentary moment of deliverance, but because you have discipleship in your life. Thomas Goodwin, who's this old uh, Puritan theologian, he talked about the fact that some of us have a nostalgia about Jesus being around. And we're like, if I could have just lived back then and seen Jesus and touched him and, and, and been able to kind of hear his teachings, I would have been such a better follower of Jesus. And yet in the gospels, Jesus goes, actually, when I leave, you get something better. You get the spirit. And we don't, and, and, and so Thomas Goodman said, don't you realize we actually get God, Jesus inside of us, not externally. We're doing better than them. So, so there's a bunch of things. The Holy Spirit does a whole bunch of stuff through scripture. I'll give you a couple of them. We could go on and on about it, but let me just name a couple of them. First, the doctrine of regeneration, what theologians talk about. And this means the Holy Spirit is the person of God who regenerates you, who saves you. So re, re meaning rewind, generate, a new birth. That's the idea. You get a new birth in the person, through the person and the work of Jesus. That's the way it happens. So every single one of us needs that. The reason you need this second birth is because you born naturally cannot enter heaven. You cannot enter the kingdom of God just by your natural birth because you're born into sin, you have a sinful nature, all of that. And so you can't come into the presence of God like now. Some of you are like, oh, well, I don't like the idea of the fact that we're born sinful. 
right? And it's like, if you doubt the idea that we're born sinful because you think it's mean, listen, just look at any kid around you. They're, they're just morons, right? They're just like absolutely sinful to the core. And that's the reality, and that's biblical. That's 1 Corinthians talks about the idea of foolishness, morons. That's literally the Greek word. I got my buddy, he's got a five-year-old. If you doubt any kind of sinful nature, just watch him. He's violent, he steals, he's conniving, he lies. Listen, my daughter a few years ago had this birthday party. So when she was, I remember, I always remember this when she was like six or seven years old. She had this frozen theme birthday party, right? All the kids are, there was a snowman and Elsa and people are singing all the songs. And it was crazy. And, but people, these kids were going around my house. They were stealing stuff. They were fighting, throwing cheese. It was a den of iniquity, guys. If you doubt there's this, listen, and then there was, there was this great moment where my daughter decided to pray. So all those girls are coming around and they're partying and then they stop and they prayed. And my middle daughter, Hayden, she's like, I want to pray, dad, I want to pray. And then she just goes, thank you, God, for me. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is just narcissism on display. Thank you for the gift that I am. And it was like this moment, I'm like, oh my gosh, we need regeneration, guys. The first birth ain't going to cut it. You're not holy enough. You're not righteous enough. And so here's the thing, uh, and, and you know, in this in this moment, there was the stillness, uh, you know, before the Lord, where all the kids went dead quiet, and all these kids were, and and they were just zoned into this. And my daughter's like, "Thank you for me." And then at that moment, the grace one, and then Amen, and boom, back to depravity. There was like holiness descended, and then kids were stabbing each other again. It was chaos. You are born into this situation, and you need a new birth, guys. Now, how does this new birth come about? How do you, John chapter three, Jesus says you gotta be born again. How does that happen? John one already told us, it pulls the veil back and it says, there's something that we see on our level. Like those of you who've given your life to Jesus, there's something you see on our level behind, we, you know, we come to Christ, but behind the scenes, there's something else going on, right? And it's basically, here's, here's what John says. You need, this is verse 12 of John chapter one. He says, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How does that happen? Verse 13, who were born not of the blood of the will of man, but of the will of God. So what he just said is when you get regenerated by the spirit, that's not you know, what looks like you receiving, what, what looks like you receiving, what looks like you making a decision, when you pull the veil back, it's actually God birthing you, which means you have about as much to do with your second birth as you did your first one, which is nothing. Your parents decided one night that the mood was right and the candles were hitting and it was great on a Tuesday and you're born, right? You need nothing to bring that into existence. My point is this, God gets the glory and you don't. How many of you know that? How many of you know who's responsible? See, this is the beautiful thing, because if you have to save yourself, you're gonna fumble it every time. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. He, he takes the sinful natural and he creates a new birth and new life, which is a beautiful thing. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. He said, when the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have, all that time, idiot-like, been saying over and over, you'll not talk about the joy of words. I saw well why the gods do not speak to us openly, nor let us answer. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? And then he ends in this beautiful quote from a book called Till We Have Faces, where he says, how can they meet us face to face till we have faces? What that whole quote means is, Meaning, why would the gods, why would God, he can't even see us until we have faces. Meaning our identity has to actually change. We have to have an identity that is worthy of being with him. And until that new birth happens, we don't. So what does the Holy Spirit do? Gives us new birth and also secondly empowers us for a full life. Th listen, the vision of the Christian life, some of you, you're living without power right now because you're not living out the vision of the Christian life. He, he, the vision of the Christian life is not, well, you said a prayer at summer camp, you're justified forensically before God and you got fire insurance and now you move on and you make sure you're not going to hell and you move on with your life. That's not it, right? Uh, Dallas Willard talks about the concept of vampire Christianity, the group of people who say, give me your blood, Lord, and then I'll just meet you in heaven one day. That is not the biblical picture. I remember reading this poster a while ago. I think I was explaining this in one, in one of the messages I gave a couple months ago where it was this poster that said, I would rather die of thirst than drink from the cup of mediocrity. 
And it's like some of you are living a mediocre life. And I don't want you to. None of your pastors want you to. Jeff doesn't want you to. It's like, are you living in the power of the Spirit to get everything God has for you? That's what the story of the Bible is all about. The practical power for real life, real transformation, real change. So we, I was, uh, I'll give you an example of this. I, there was this cop police officer who's part of our church, and he came to me uh, recently. He said, listen, Mark, um, I saw some things this week. I saw some files. He was working on, I can't even describe them to you. He, he described them to me, but I won't describe them for you. But he saw some files in a case, and he said, I haven't been able to sleep in weeks. I don't know what to do. And so can you come and pray for me? And I just went and I just prayed over him. We prayed for a while, and I was like, Holy Spirit, you just got to take these images off this man's mind. And, and I'm not calling on my own power. I'm not calling on his power. I'm not calling on some six steps to a better life. I'm just calling on you, Holy Spirit, to just wash this man's brain because I am at the end of myself. I can't create a reality in you, bro, where you can unsee stuff. I can't do that. So I need to ask the Spirit to do it. That's when amazing things happen, guys. And so I'm praying supernatural peace over this man. He called me up uh, a couple nights later and he said, dude, I slept like a baby last night and I've been sleeping ever since, okay. That's the power of the spirit to do something super practical in your life. This isn't just, I know I just did a whole bunch of theology for the last 10 minutes and you're like, ooh, my head's spinning. Listen, this is real life, this is in your life, this is the daily stuff. Don't just keep the spirit as some vague religious world of your life. It's an everyday experience when you're filled with the spirit and able to actually function in a power this week. There's a woman at our church a bit ago, and we were talking on the phone, and she was in hospital, and she was struggling with cancer. And I was just like, man, she's like, I'm resting right now. And I'm like, I'm, man, are you going to come out of the hospital? What's going on? And she's like, I don't think I'm coming out. And she got the diagnosis. She wasn't coming out. And she had these young kids. She was newly married. I had done their wedding. And she was just facing the reality of her own death. And I, told, I was talking to her, and I, and I just sensed almost through the phone there was this supernatural peace in her life. Just in her voice, there was like a peace. I'm like, Wait, aren't you scared of dying? Like we just had this real relationship and she's like, no, no, I'm not actually afraid of dying. I'm, I'm afraid for my kids, um, but I'm not afraid of dying. And she's like, I just have this, this peace that I can never explain. I mean, the Bible says a peace that surpasses understanding. So you're anxious, you're fearful, you got stuff going on, you're stressed in life, and you're trying to solve it by all these things. And the Bible's going, no, no, I got a solution. It's the, it's the presence of the Spirit in your life. That's the thing. God's empowering presence. That's the thing. And so that's what the gospel holds out for us, something that transcends our experience. She, she was tapping into something that transcended hers, and that's the reality of all of us. It's actually mind-boggling what God puts on offer. So when we pass over this text and it goes, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, this is the kind of power we're talking about. So all of that is what Luke means when he's talking about being filled with the Spirit. She has this new birth. She's being sanctified in Jesus. She's actually walking in power. And then verse 40 to 41 says this, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord, now this is a crazy little phrase, there's like 23 times in Luke, one and two where the Lord means God. So Elizabeth knows that she, what she's saying. She's saying that the mother of God should come to me and blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. That's what she said. So here's what I love about this. And I want you to grab a hold of this just practically in your life. The absolute absence of jealousy that Elizabeth has toward this woman, Mary, her cousin, who's gonna accomplish way more than her in this life. Like, like, there's this way she's functioning. Like, we have an obsession in our culture with comparing ourselves to everybody. We compare ourselves to other people. And it's very difficult to get excited for people when they're probably gonna accomplish more in their life than us. And if they make more money than us, if they're more successful than us, then it, we just can't get ourselves to be jacked about it. And in Elizabeth, it's beautiful because she has this crucial identity that's in Christ that shrivels any kind of comparison or jealousy. She knows who she is. Do you? 
She knows what God has called her to, her specific role in history, giving birth to John the Baptist, not giving birth to Jesus, her place in this story. And she's like, I'm so comfortable with my place. I'm not comparing myself to anything else because I know I'll never be happy. Comparison is toxic toward your contentment, guys, right? That, that's what it is. This woman who's been advancing in years, she's been visited by an angel who comes in and goes, barren woman, you tried for years and years and years to have a baby and I'm giving you a baby. So she's had her own miraculous, magical angel story and she's having a baby in a few months. She's the life of the party in that town, man. She's like, this old lady's having a baby. This is crazy to me. No, and then this 15-year-old walks in and goes, oh, and she's like, oh, barren woman. I'm, I, hey, oh, by the way, I'm a virgin. I'm not just old. I've never slept with anyone. And by the way, that baby in your womb, he's just gonna serve my baby. All right, you would think, all right, I was the only one with a magical story. Now this one comes in with her 15-year-old virgin baby and I got nothing. She could have done that. Compare, compare, compare. It's what we do. Every time, guys, listen to me. Every time you pick up your phone and you scroll and you start to compare, guys, you start to compare, oh man, I wish my wife looked like that. Man, that body's great. That woman really keeps herself going. I can't believe, uh, man, I wish I would have married someone else. You are going against the very thing Elizabeth is doing here. What about, okay, just, you're not off the hook, ladies. What about when you scroll and you go, oh man, Tom makes so much more money than my husband. Why is Tom always going to places I want to go to? Going to Rome every five months? What's going on? What have you done for me lately, bro? You should get a job. You should be successful. And we compare and we compare and we compare and it kills our soul. And what changes that for her is an absolute contentment in Jesus Christ where she's like, I know that I'm sinful. And she has no pride, by the way. See, let me tell you the one thing God hates about humankind, and I know it because the Bible talks about it. Proverbs chapter six says there are six things that God hates. You know what the first one is? Pride, arrogance, he hates it. So there's a, there's a, a guy in my office a few months ago. He's this young kind of church planter. He wants to be a church planter. He's like, man, I want to plant a church. I want to be, I want to be just like the church you planted. I'm going to do something great. And I'm like, cool, man. Like, that's great. I'm like, so you're a leader? He's like, yeah, I'm a leader. And, and so I said, okay. So the first thing to ask a leader is who's following you. Uh, and if no one's following you, then you're not a leader. But uh, he goes, one day I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And, and I said, okay, great. Uh, so let me ask you, how many times have you preached? And he's like, I've preached like, God, uh, I've preached like six, seven times, bro. And I'm like, oh, okay. So before I ever thought about planting a church, I preached every week for one hour for five or six years. And he's like, yeah, 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 but I, I want to skip all that stuff. I want to get right to the good stuff. And I'm like, this guy's never going to make it. His arrogance, his pride is going to skip past the humility it's going to take. That's the thing. And here's what Mary, and this is one of the scariest verses in the Bible, is part of Mary's song as it relates to you and me. Verse 50, right? Look at it. It says, he, meaning God, has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. This is beautiful. This is the song of Mary, by the way. Would you go on by? But we don't have time for it. Listen, what is he against? He's against the pride and the arrogance that would keep you out of the kingdom. So what are we, what are we doing? Have you humbled yourself? Because when you humble yourself, God stops trying to scatter you. And you receive what Mary goes on to say in verse 54. He has helped to serve in Israel in remembrance of his mercy. You know how you get mercy? You know how you get mercy from God? You become humble. There's this great story in the Gospels which rocks us a little bit. Jesus is walking along and a woman walks up to Jesus. Now listen to the story. This is crazy because some of you are sitting here right now. You've never become a believer in Jesus. You're a skeptic and you're kind of fighting against all this Christian stuff. And you're like, ah, oh, let me get on with it here. Let me go on with my day. Listen, she's walking along, walks up to Jesus and says, can you heal my son? And now she's a Gentile, so Jesus says to her as a Jew, he says, I am here, this is in Matthew chapter 10, crazy story, he says, I am here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I will not heal your son because you're a Gentile. And then he says, and dogs should not eat 
what's being fed at the master's table. Now, what crazy verse is that? That's Jesus calls her a dog. You know what she goes? I can't believe this. I'm canceling this guy. Get this guy out of my life. Forget it. I'm going on a revolution against Jesus. You know what she goes? She says, but dogs, don't the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table? And he goes, I've never seen faith like this in Israel. Your son is healed. Why? Because she came to a place, as crazy as it sounds to you and me, where she saw herself as a dog and didn't even fight it. And it could be spiritually, whatever it is. That's the prerequisite to get mercy. Stop. She had to come to a place where she stopped seeing herself as worthy. And some of you are sitting here like, I'm worthy. I'm a good, I can do this. I can perform for God. Maybe I'll get to heaven in the end and I'll bring all my good deeds and I'll put them in God, I'll weigh them and he'll let me into heaven. That's what every religion in the world is based on. And it's like, no, no. You either put your own life in front of God in the end or you put Jesus' life for you in the end. That's the only option for you. So what are you going to do? Where are you at in your life to be able to say, I've come to the place of humility where I'm going, Jesus, I want, I want your mercy. So I just pray, Lord, that a text like this would kind of speak to our hearts. Our, specifically this week, this massive theme of kind of this almost an arrogant heart that approaches life as if we're in control and thus our anxiety but also that maybe we can save ourselves, and that the whole Christmas story would just be fighting against that to go, man, no, actually I want mercy and the only way to do it is to humble myself from thinking I'm on the throne of my life to the humblest state because that's when you show up. That's when you start to move and there's just people watching this that need that kind of humility and Holy Spirit as we talked about you today, we know that's actually the only way to get it so that we in this moment would receive the conviction Holy Spirit, speak to us, save us, seal us, even in this moment. Some people would give their life to you for the first time, even in this moment. Do that work among us. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen.